Hello and welcome to Melody and Friends, where I will be taking a virtual tour around the world and interviewing all kinds of wonderful people. And today we land in North Carolina with my friend Sandra Baum to talk about pathology and more specifically dangerous and pathological partners. Welcome, Sandra. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I think maybe before we dive into the meat of your book and what you do, why don't you just tell um, my audience a little bit of just about who you are and how you even ended up in the, the path that you're on? Um, well, I am a psychotherapist. Um, I worked uh, in the field of psychopathology and then switched over to working in trauma mostly with women. I began my, that journey through, like a lot of people do, victimization. Um, my father was murdered in 1983 and mm -hmm. um, threw me into a journey of having to learn how to um, heal from my own PTSD and trauma. And so I've utilized that and working um, with, with other people, particularly mostly women. Mm, that's awesome. That's really awesome. Um, and so, sounds like you had your own trauma with you know related to your your father's um, death. And was that around pathology as well? And that's where you got really curious about your what you do. Well, it definitely had an impact because anyone that can murder someone you know, led me down the path of what is that in psychology and in mental health. And so I definitely took a deep dive there. In fact, that's my career started mm -hmm. um, off first in the field of, of psychopathology and later went into trauma. But that definitely made me sit up and take notice wow. uh, because most of, you know, most of the general public knows nothing about pathology. Yeah. And, and we obviously mental health, especially I think post COVID is a much more of a buzzword. You know, we're, we're, we're becoming more aware. We're paying closer attention, but let's, let's maybe take a deeper dive into pathology. How would you define pathology? It's not a word we hear a lot. Well, the big word is psychopathology and it's its own field within psychology. And I think part of the problem that that the general public doesn't really understand psychopathology is because what is promoted a lot in the psychology field is positive psychology. Mm. I call it Oprahology. <clears throat> we can all grow and change and be better people, but there's a whole division uh, of psychology that is based on people that can't do that. That um, a lot of mental health is based on what we call episodic problems or disorders. Psychopathology is different than episodic disorders. Episodic disorders that we know most about that people associate with psychology are things like um, depression, anxiety, addictions, bipolar. Those are, are sort of um, disorders that come and go. If we're lucky, they go. <laughs> but psychopathology is, is the kinds of disorders that never go. They are lifetime disorders in which anybody who is dealing with somebody that has pathology, it, it, they're going to deal with it over a lifetime. And what has happened is that, um, you know, the general public doesn't understand the difference between episodic and, and pathology. And so you have partners that are very hopeful that their person has a more episodic kind of disorder um, that is fairly responsive to treatment. But there's this whole batch of disorders um, that are sort of woven into even their biology, their neuro condition, genetics, um, heredity, 
that um, are, are things that people are going to have for a lifetime and that their partner in making an informed decision to stay in this difficult relationship needs to understand, are they dealing with something that is going to get a, you know, better through treatment and maybe um, never be experienced again? Or is this a light, um, you know, a likely lifetime disorder that they're going to have to navigate the rest of their relationship? Wow. So I want to, in a minute, I really want to unpack some of what's in your book. But when you were talking about that, where I was going in my head a little bit was, so you've got, I'll just, I'll, I'll tee up a, a scenario that I see a lot. So I work with a lot of women whose spouses are struggling with pornography, sexual addiction, so many times emotional abuse that might move into domestic abuse, but you, you, you said episology. So you have addictions, but let's say you've got a guy who started looking at pornography at eight. And so he's got, and, and with that comes lying and gaslighting and a lot defensive, you know, all the things, but when does that move from addiction to pathology where there now becomes more emotional abuse, indifference, contempt, and gaslighting, all, all those more abusive behaviors. How do you know when it's episology or pathology? Um, it's not either or. Okay. So um, the, the biggest group of disorders that are known for um, being within pathology are what are called personality disorders. Okay. And um, when a person has a personality disorder, they that usually develops early in childhood and then continues in um, its development and display, if you will, of that over a lifetime. And so the addiction just becomes a layer or what we call a co, you know, a co-occurring or a coexisting thing that goes along with personality disorders. And what mm -hmm. makes pathology so difficult is they don't usually have just one disorder, like a personality disorder, like antisocial personality disorder. The big buzzword now is narcissism, but there's lots, there's 10 different personality disorders. They could have any one of those 10, but what goes along with that tends to be addiction, mm. um, uh, mood disorders, depression, anxiety, bipolar. Um, there, there's a lot of other things, which is what makes pathology so complex in dealing with it, living with it, or living around it mm. is because it's never just one thing. Right. The foundation of it is the personality disorder. Then there's all the other stuff that goes with it. Which I think is so interesting because there, the, a lot of this education is not out there. So you've got all these recovery centers treating addictions, which right. is basically what you're saying is the secondary issue when the primary issue is most more, maybe possibly the personality well, absolutely. And personality disorders are the ones that fail addiction treatment all the time because they're not getting to the root of it. Not that there's tons of what we can do about the personality that's already developed in childhood, but it makes treatment different. Even in addictions and trauma, you have to know what the root is. They're just dealing with the layers that are on top. And so that's why, unfortunately, I ran a personality disorder clinic in the beginning of why I thought that was a good idea. I don't know, but that was how I started off as a new therapist is I ran a personality disorder clinic and they're known for treatment failure because everybody comes up here and starts dealing with the addiction or their relationship problems or their bad parenting that the, you know, they're not effective in parenting. They they go up here when they, you know, when the issue is at the root. And it's how the personality did not develop. 
So we'll talk a little bit about treatment in a minute, but I, I want to jump over into your book because I, again, I, you, you, your book and your platform and what you do is all new to me. Um, but I, I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, part of your book, let's stick my glasses on real quick. It says pathology implies a person's inability to one, change or consistently sustain positive changes two grow to any meaningful emotional or spiritual depth three develop insights about how his behavior negatively affects others i'd love to unpack each one of those because that that's pretty profound it's 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 very practical but it's very profound as well of just these specifics that we can be looking for so maybe let's unpack number 1 change or consistently sustain positive change or did you want to say something before that that's really at the crux. Those three things are, are at the crux of what is the problem in personality disorders and why they have such a high level of low, low treatment outcome or failed treatment is because those three things are required for success in counseling to grow, change, and have insight. Mm. And if you have a disorder that limits your ability to grow, change, and develop insight, what are we doing in counseling? I mean, that's the whole purpose, you know, right. of counseling. And, and that, I mean, it's sad because, you know, in personality disorder development, that's what gets stunted in them. And then their inability to do those three things is what ends up, you know, creating treatment failure and why their relationships are so difficult, you know, lifelong. Well, and so many of the women, I guess, that I walk with, we're, you know, we're constantly, is is it is it me? Maybe I can read another book, or maybe I can continue counseling. And and what what we're finding is there's there's so much over-functioning taking place because they are under-functioning, not willing to go to counseling or show up or grow or even ask people, how are you experiencing me? And so we just keep trying to change, change, change ourselves, which is really all we can do. But at some point, it, it's pretty devastating when they realize, wait, I just don't think he's ever going to change or even want to. Well, yeah. And, and that's the problem is that we have not had good public pathology education where people know the difference between an episodic disorder like trauma or you know, anxiety and, and those that truly are going to have very limited change throughout the, their lifetime. And that one of the books I wrote was How to Spot a Dangerous Man. And it was the first book to really look at and name some of these pathologies that people are not going to get going to want to get in a relationship with because of this low ability to change. We all have stuff. Right. And so, but a lot of times our stuff is stuff we can actually work on because we have the ability to change, grow, um, and develop insight. And one of the books I wrote was How to Spot a Dangerous Man. And that book was to alert people to the types of pathologies um, that you don't want to get in a relationship with. If, if you can learn how to sort of spot them because of their inability to change, grow, and develop insight. And I mean, then that's like the kiss of death to a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have to be in that relationship long enough to where you can see that too, right? Um, and we're, there's so much at least where I where a lot I live in the South, sometimes it's harder to pick up on some of those because you have the the covert niceness, charisma. So talk a little bit about that. Just talk a little bit about dangerous men, how to spot a dangerous man. Well, <clears throat> I wrote that book in 2005. And if I was to write that book today, I wouldn't write that book. Mm. Because, you know, that was 17 years ago. We've learned a whole lot, mm. or at least I have, you know, um, that a lot of times this stuff, as you said, 
isn't always um, upfront. They wait, you know, into the relationship. And when the mask falls off, as we say, then you begin to really see it. So, you know, part of what I said before and having poor public pathology education is that, that people tend to learn, look for surface kinds of things, politeness and things like that. When a lot of these people have worn a mask, they've learned since you know childhood how to fit into society, and so I think that causes um, a lot of people not to be able to pick up on that. Yeah. And, um, along with our poor public pathology education, and so the truth is that a lot of times they are sicker than we are smart. Mm -hmm. And that we are well into the relationship before we get those um, red flags. And so, you know, as much as we would like to have 10 ways to never end up in one of these relationships, the longer I've worked in this field, the more I know they are sicker than we are smart and they know how to look normal mm -hmm. um, into, you know, deeper parts of the relationship before you actually see it. By then women are invested, they have years invested, they're emotionally heart invested. And it's not that easy, you know, to say, oh, I saw five red flags, I'm out of here. You're married, you have kids. Right. Yeah. And and just yeah, in a dependent relationship. And I think that's the hardest part because and and the love bombing many times is like those little crumbs that just give you another year. <laughs> you know? Hope, oh, well, maybe he is going to change or maybe he is, you know, and it's it's those cookie crumbs that just, you know, 20, 30 years down the road, women are just right. devastated. And that goes back to the thing that we were talking about before about not being able to sustain change. Yeah. And yeah. so love bombing looks like it's deliberate you know, as a way to keep you in there. And that may be true on some levels, but it's also a snapshot of pathology that they can't sustain positive changes. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I promise I won't yell or scream or I'll go to counseling or I'll go to church. And it might be sustained for a couple of weeks, if you're lucky, a couple of months. And, you know, pathology, we call it um, the rubber band that we call it the rubber band effect. We can, you know, we they can stretch themselves um, for a few weeks, if you're lucky, a few months to try to do this new kind of behavior. But by nature of the disorder, pathology will always be what it is, that the behavior reverts back. And so um, <coughs> that's their inability to, it's not that they can't, learn new behavior it's that they can't sustain new behavior and so what looks like love bombing like you said you know they sustain it for two weeks or two months so you're hopeful the behavior snaps back we see pathology just being <coughs> what it is doing what it does and then there's a few more you know love bombing things so now you've got another couple weeks or a couple months woven into that and it becomes the relationship cycle that can be decades of yeah. that kind of behavior and so that's really good I think the biggest word is sustain you know like when when you see somebody say something and they can't follow through with it or they just can't sustain anything long term that that's very problematic for the relationship you know whether we're trying to get on the same page financially or parentally or spiritually you know all these promises and they can't sustain anything for any limit of time that's that's really good insight I, I'm, I'm really grateful that you just shared that what about relationships how do they make how do they do with relationships um, well, usually they come into counseling because of their relationships. Um, they are notoriously awful. So you have this inability to sustain, you know, positive change, um, which destabilizes the relationship. And they have no insight about how their behavior 
is affecting others. Um, I mean, certainly we see that in other episodic issues like addiction. Certainly when someone's actively using, they have no insight, right? Um, you know, kind of thing. But with treatment, that's part of recovery is that they do gain insight. But in pathology, there are neuro differences in the brain and um, personality disorders than the normal brain. And some of these contribute to that inability to sustain change um, and to have insight. So do you see pathology change? Somebody that has a pathological problem, do you do you see that change? Or is it really a, a woman, it, it's basically up to a woman make, deciding, I'm either going to stay in this relationship and be incredibly disappointed, but boundaried, or I'm going to have to make a decision to get out of the relationship. They don't sustain change. So um, do we see some behavioral changes short term? Yes. Um, but they're not long term changes. And usually people, normal people, can't deal with that. It's a destabilizing force to themselves personally, certainly to the environment their children live in, and certainly, um, you know, in the relationship. If you can ride that roller coaster, go for it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, what I said in the book is that their recovery is measured in millimeters mm. where their damage is measured in miles. And, uh, you know, I, the only people that I see long-term when they finally figure it out, when someone really explains pathology to them are people who are dependent. Yeah. And so, depending on the severity of dependency, that's a personality disorder too. I mean, right. it's seen on the spectrum, but some that are really, really dependent have a dependent personality disorder. And so sometimes you will see those kinds of dependent people be in relationships with narcissists or antisocials because they don't have, you know, the capacity um, to leave that. But most normal people, the people, you know, the survivors I have worked with that don't right. have their own dependency need the education in order to make an informed decision. And then even though it's painful, even though there's trauma bonding, even though there's all sorts of stuff, they are still able to painfully, you know, separate from that and then go through the recovery process of what it did to them. Well, and let's talk about let's talk about those two types of people because I I'm in agreement with you 100% that you know in healthy relationships when you or normal is what you're referring to when you choose to say I like you but this is not working out for me anymore when you're talking to a healthy person they can say that makes me really sad but okay you know they they let you walk out of the relationship in pathology that is not the case. Um, and so what I have found both personally and walking with women is that when you make the decision, I cannot do this anymore. This is hurting me and it's going to continue to hurt me to stay in this relationship. So when you make a decision to step out of that, it doesn't necessarily get easier. Correct? No, no. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So, you know, underneath these personality disorders, it is everything that sh did not happen in childhood that should have. What didn't happen in their childhood is secure attachment. And that's what makes us healthy individuals able to have healthy relationships. Personality disorders are like We've heard a lot about attachment and attachment theory. Personality disorders are like the 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 top the creme de la creme of attachment disorders mm -hmm. and attachment problems. 
And so while they might be boisterous on the surface and bossy and demanding, underneath there is a broken child that didn't develop the way that they get what they needed at that time. But we don't get a redo on personality. You can't back up the train and you know just love them into getting a redo during childhood when the personality should have been developed. Right. Those cracks in there are lifelong. This is the importance of early attachment about good parenting when you're young because you don't get a redo. Right. You end up with personality disorders and trauma and attachment problems. And, and so even though they're very boisterous, maybe on the surface, they have huge abandonment issues. And when a person goes to leave the relationship, um, they don't allow it. I mean, this is where stalking and violence and a lot of things, you know, come into play that has a lot to do um, with that attachment problem. And these are the hardest relationships ever to get out of um, and, and need safety planning for as well. Yeah, and, and I've found that not only could it be the more overt behaviors like that, but sometimes it's the more passive aggressive, you know, locking people out of um, accounts, using the kids to create parent alienation, almost to where you're trying to get away. And then when those happen, you know, you get locked out of all your accounts, you're normally going to go back home, you know, to, to something like that, or you start feeling alienated from your kids. Again, another situation where, you know, that that creates so much more chaos for the for the wife or the spouse. Absolutely. And, and I think if we just ask ourselves the question, who does that? Right. Why, you know, your normal soccer dad is not going to do that. Right. Psychology does that. That's right. an indicator right there that the courts are not reading into it that normal people don't alienate, even if you get divorced. Uh, normal people don't alienate. They want, they see the benefit of the other parent. They don't not pay child support. They don't drag their ex-wife through court and traumatize the children. Right. Who does that? Usually right. people who have pathology or personality disorders do that. You yeah. think the court would realize that, but they haven't. Are you seeing any improvement in um, mental health counseling? Um, I'm, I know churches are a totally different <laughs> ball of wax, but are you seeing are you seeing court systems becoming more aware? Because some of these guys they can pass lie detector test, they can even pass, you know, psychiatry. I mean, if they've been lying, you know, and all that, there's so many things that they can actually pass that that can still create a lot of problems for these women that are going to court and trying to get their kids and all that. Well, are you seeing any kind of changes in the court system or? No. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know that I'll work long enough. You know, I'm talking about retirement now, but when I had more energy, <laughs> what I had thought about, um, you know, one of our goals was judicial training. Right. That this is not just domestic violence. This isn't just a bad breakup. This is nothing is going to change in our broken court um, system until judges also understand psychopathology. The reason it is a different division, even in our diagnostic manual, is it's the most severe. And right. isn't that something we should be aware of? The most severe. Those that are most severe um, aren't those ones that are at risk for um, child abduction, alienation, violence, um, homicide, and children that die. And yet we don't differentiate pathology, which need, it definitely needs to be differentiated from just that domestic violence, the situational abuser who had a meltdown. In personality disorders, these are the people that don't benefit from batter intervention, that are the alienators, that the abductors, the 
um, the ones that will be in court drag somebody through court for 10 years. Who does that? Nobody, no normal person likes court. Right. Um, yeah. And so while all that should be screaming that there are different, there is obviously a differentiation in these types of relationships, the courts are not doing that. And then you have, you know, organizations like NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, who advocate on behalf of any kind of mental illness um, for personality disorder people as if um, they have the same parenting capabilities as people that don't have pathology. And so we absolutely have this horribly broken <clears throat> court system um, that is not recognizing um, pathology and how this, we are talking about the creme de la creme of severity. Yeah. Well, and I'm just going to add in there, you know, before we, you know, talk about something else, just this, that healing path for a woman, but I work with so many women that are also in church, Sandra, and you know, they, they finally get the courage to go to the church, which is not, we're not nearly at the beginning of this. We're probably 80, 85, 90% in before she finally says something because she's tried everything, you know, and she finally gets to church and she either sits in a room with all men or they begin to say, well, what are your issues? You're sharing these issues with him, almost like, like his pathology, which they don't know what that is, but basically like, okay, this is a marriage issue. And so many women are like, no, this is not a marriage issue. <laughs> like I have tried to fix the marriage part of me, but like there, you know, it's almost labeled, okay, there's this marriage issue. What about, what is your sin? If this is his sin. And it's just much more frustrating path for her to go on and really can create almost more trauma and spiritual abuse. Do you, do you see that a lot? Absolutely. Um, when I first began, I worked in a mega church and, um, and, you know, pathology is in many forms, even in the pulpit, yeah. um, even in the elders and deacons. But the, the first issue is, is that, you know, women are going to the wrong source. This mm -hmm. is way beyond what church staff are trained for. Right. I mean, any of this sounds familiar to your listeners, they are not trained at that level. Don't go there. Uh, you know, half the problem is we seek help from the wrong types. Right. And, and they're good for some things, but not this. The, uh, this is, you know, a specialization. I went, you know, had years of training for. Um, this is not something that church trained staff, I, I know they think a lot of times the Bible is the answer to everything. Um, and that um, they're not likely, you know, to find any insight about this psychological level of disorder from a church. And yeah. so I think a lot of times survivors get off on the wrong foot um, mm -hmm. because they go to the wrong source for what they're looking for. Yeah, we've actually started doing some, you know, if you go, you know, if your husband is struggling with sex addiction and you go to a pastor or a counselor and they say, well, you need to have sex more, whatever, that's, that's your vetting process to Exit. find somebody else. Almost like you're look, you've got cancer, like you can keep, find, you can keep looking until you find the right person, you know, to, to, to validate your pain and to you know, speak to what you're going through and help you get super boundaryed up or get you to a place of safety. I think a lot of women go to like one or two places and then they're just, they feel like that's the place that they've got to stay. Yeah. So let's talk about just what, what, how can we help her? You know, if, if you are in a relationship with a man that is pathological, like what are some things that she can do right out of the gate? Um. Well, first of all, she's probably, you know, not in the best <laughs> position to know that. Yeah. Um, and, and so she really needs to go to a credible source. There's a million other survivors out there writing about narcissistic abuse. That's not where you want to go. Right. This is a specialization. Like I said, I spent years in it to understand it. They make 
narcissists, you know, sound like anybody who's crabby. Right. You know, um, don't, you know, go to somebody who's actually got some credentials and being having been in an abusive relationship, it isn't always the best and only credential they should look for. And, and so they can, you know, automatically assume this person is pathological and they aren't which means they might have an opportunity, you know, um, if they have, the partner has episodic issues, they might actually have a, an opportunity to go to good therapy and the partner do, you know, improve. Um, but someone who knows something needs to differentiate because that then becomes um, the hard path in, in um, you know, making an informed decision when there really is a personality disorder involved. And um, and usually in the beginning, the women don't believe it. They, they, they keep looking for somebody else, some other writer that's going to give them better news about personality disorders. Um, and it, it takes a while um, of once they know what they're looking at, it takes them a while of watching it in action. Hmm. But when, it's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right. But what it does is that a lot of times it takes a while to accept that, to get to a level of acceptance around that. But when they have good pathology education, good information, and they begin to spot it in that can't sustain positive change, kind of way and they keep seeing the repeating pattern of it um they can't unsee it and it, and it takes a while to build up um and then wrap their head around it and come to a level of acceptance about yeah this isn't sustained change they it, it, it's not even maybe willful behavior right. they may want to sustain it and can't sustain it and then that really becomes the issue uh, of an informed decision. But usually what happens is, you know, these are women <clears throat> full of empathy. And when they understand this as an issue that happened in childhood, my God, how can they be a horrible person to leave someone whose disorder started in childhood that they're not responsible for? Mm -hmm. and, and that, yes, yeah, um, especially empathetic people are going to go there. They're going to have to struggle through that. And I call it um, compassionate disengagement, that I can feel bad for everything that they lived through and didn't get, and it's not their fault, but I myself can't go down the tubes. Right. And my kids go down the, the tubes because of what they didn't get. And this is where generational trauma is either continued or broken. That's right. That I stay here because I feel bad for him and his generational trauma. And then I'm generationally traumatized. And now my kids are too. Someone has to break the cycle. Right. And I often think that's what that Bible verse about the sins of the father are always passed down to the sixth and seventh generation. That's generational trauma right there. Right. And if we can't get in a place of compassionate um, disengagement or yeah, we can feel all those feelings and feel bad for them and still see that um, we have, you know, compassion for that person um, and still know that we, we will be the next generation of traumatized people in my, yeah. and the children and their children. We can have generational trauma if we want to stay and, and, and stay in this, or we can be compassionate. Um, to ourselves, to our partner who's disordered, feel compassion for that and to ourselves and to our children and still see that um, there's the necessary step that has to happen um, in order to prevent more trauma. Yeah, I love how you said that, that there's, it's really, it's loving yourself well, it's loving the the pathological person well and loving your kids well to at some point say, I can't, I'm loving myself well enough to step out of this harm and to break the generational um, sins of the father, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and what I have found, because so many women struggle with, but God hates divorce. And I said, but God values the sanctity of a life more than he loves marriage, you know. But that doesn't and, even meet the qualifications of a marriage. Right. So I, I wrote this ebook for the Step Christian that talks about pathology and scripture, actually. Uh, what you call it? Would you call it? Um, I wrote this ebook. Um, it's Neither called. Uh, well, no, I run it as a series. Uh, email me and I'll send it to you. Okay. It's called For the Stuck Christian, but it actually, my undergraduate degree is in theology. Okay. So um, that actually talks about pathology in the scriptures. And um, it, it, it's quite an in depth read, but it, there's an argument for whether or not pathology counts as marriage in that. But the bigger issue is, is that, you know, we talked about the pathological partner and in their childhood not getting what they needed. And so the, the survivor's children are at the same place. They could be setting up a personality disorder in their children. Right. By staying in that pathological relationship. That could, the very same thing that was sad that happened to their, their husband or wife, they could be setting up in their own children's and then their children. Right. Somewhere generational trauma and curse have to be broken even though we do it being sad and compassionate to, you know, the pathological partner. And it's not an oxymoron right. that we can be compassionate and disengage. Right. Right. And, you know, like you said earlier in our podcast that, you know, normally with pathology um, there's addictions. And so I, I have found personally that when there's addictions, abuse and adulterous relations, whatever that looks like, you, you can make a decision to step out of the relationship um, and not be so attached to, but God hates divorce. I mean, there are specific scenarios within scriptures that say you can get a divorce and you, know, cause if you got a pathological parent and you've got a, a partner that's bleeding out, the kids are going to be floundering. You're going to have all kinds of generational things that, that, that absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So. So just maybe, so we know that a, a wife or a partner or spouse whose husband is struggling with this pathology, we know she's got to get help. Um, we know there usually needs to be some strategy or a plan in place. You know, she can't just make a quick decision. There needs to be some, some plan in place for her to do that. But what, what are some additional steps that you feel like could be really helpful for her? Well, first of all, it is awareness and education, like I mentioned before, and to get it from a reputable um, source. Um, and then, you know, from there, there's some decisions to be made. Uh, you know, again, there's a process where they go through in denial and you're sort of waiting on that. Um, and then um, certainly if there's physical or sexual violence, um, you know, there needs to be considerations about removal right away from that. Um, and then the issue about safety planning, because again, when we say who does that, um, these are the relationships where even if there had not been violence, there might be violence when they go to leave because the, the pathological partner has such a hard time with the issues of abandonment. And so there needs to be um, safety planning. And um, I usually don't do that with my own survivors. I really think that that most of us don't know safety planning to the depth that agencies know it, like DV yeah. agencies or law enforcement, um, and that she needs to get some input on safety planning. Um, not from her girlfriend. Again, if there's any place that's going to go wrong, it's here in these relationships with that kind of disorder. 
mm-hmm. with people who have, you know, problems um, containing and managing um, their emotions. So she really needs to get, you know, outside um, help in safety planning and leaving, not just a girlfriend or not just a pastor. Uh, um, yeah. So. Yeah, because if he is, if he's beginning to feel that she's pulling away, we know that many times he starts case building. She might be crazy. She's having an affair. She's controlling and safe. I mean, all these things to where now it's, it's almost like she's getting, you know, attacked on other ends when she's just really trying to get a plan to get safe to possibly get out of there. That's right. Yeah. And, and there's things that you have to think about in advance that, you probably haven't thought about. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot to it. And it's, you know, um, an exit plan isn't, I thought about it on Friday and I'm going to do it over the weekend. Right. Um, I, the, a lot of times there's months of planning that goes into that to do it successfully or else you're back again. And every time you try to leave, it gets unsafer or there's also, sorts of things you should have done that court is never going to reward to you after you're right. gone. That's so it's, it, yeah, it pays to plan well. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. And then uh, the the other thing is, is that, a, a, you know, especially in personality disorders, this is where my work has been and where my research on trauma has been is that, you know, 75% of the women who leave relationships with someone who had a personality disorder actually have trauma. They actually have PTSD. Yes. And they don't know it. They just think it's the stress that has built up, you know, over time or years or decades. But actually, they don't know they have trauma. And then they end up going into something that they... They look for maybe the least invasive types of help out there, a support group, or maybe coaching when what they actually need is trauma treatment in the beginning. Those things might be possible later on, but a lot of them don't know that they have trauma and they start in the wrong kinds of care for it. Consequently, they don't make the kinds of good strides in recovery they might have if they started out with the right kind of care. Yeah. And if they get the right kind of care, like we we know that PTSD is very real in these scenarios. Do you have kind of a trajectory of what you say if a woman is, you know, getting the help for the trauma that she's experienced within the context of this pathological partner, like would you say a year, two years, three years, five years, those symptoms that PTSD begins to um, dissipate? Well, a couple things. Number number one, trauma is seen on a continuum. Yeah. Um, you know, um, there's lighter versions of trauma and then PTSD and complex PTSD and dissociative and catastrophic trauma. Right. So survivors who also had trauma as a child, physical, sexual abuse, um, and did not have effective treatment for that. And now they've had a pathological relationship on top of that. Most of them have complex PTSD, which is a few years of treatment. Um, and again, depending on if they waste time getting into treatment that's not effective for complex PTSD, right. you know, it has a lot to do with it. Um, a lot of the survivors that we treat that didn't have adverse childhoods, it just got PTSD in this pathological relationship. Um, we've got uh, um, a year long trauma reduction program that some of them go into. Um, and, and their symptoms are, they're not at 100%. And, and with trauma, you may never get 100%. But they notice a great improvement after the year in our trauma program and then usually go on and do another half year in working with um, some of the things that were targeted in them so that they're more aware next time going out. So I would say like a year and a half or so. Um, 
But there's, you know, as someone who had PTSD, as much as we would like to think that we just get all glued back together and, you know, I'm 30 some years out and, but I occasionally, I, it's like a stress fracture. You know, if you, if when life gets hard and certain bad things happen, uh, I my I, I think of it as a cracked vessel. That we're a vessel. We get cracked from trauma. Yep, we can super glue it back. It'll hold water. You can put your flowers in it, but you don't want to go pressing on that crack. It is a stress fracture. Yeah, and good. every once in a while, I leak. You know, um, it is. I don't leak daily like I used to. I now I leak every couple years. <laughs> if I have a really big, horrible, somebody dies or, you know, something. But I, I think that's part of the issue is that women want to go in and get, okay, let me do this, you know, online thing and be done. I, I, I'll do it six months. That, that's not how trauma works. Um, or they think the next relationship is possibly going to repair her. And we know that that does not happen. So if she can stay single for a while and really get healthy and whole apart from another relationship. Her, her success is for a good relationship. Yeah. Because she, I can tell you right now, you know, especially the ones that have trauma it is that your red flag meter is broken from trauma. Yeah. We usually ask for people entering our treatment program to give us at least a two-year commitment of not dating, not talking, not, oh, we were just friends. I don't know how this happened. We're completely intolerant of it because that is the relapse factor right there. Mm, so yeah. good. So good. That's really good. Well, any other um, any other things that you feel like would be beneficial for a woman who's maybe just beginning to get curious, like something's off or we keep this, we keep going back to the cycle every three months. You know, he loves moms me or shares all the, you know, says, gives me all these promises. And then we're back to the same thing where I just keep getting devastated or blindsided again and again and again. Well, start keeping um, a list, not a journal. Um, don't write all your emotions about it. That's very triggering to someone who is in the middle of that. Their emotions aren't very well regulated and journaling about it just sort of explodes it. But make a list and date it of the uh, you know, these inconsistencies and begin to look at the inability to sustain change and make a list and put the dates on it. And then, um, you know, keep looking back and see how long you and your kids want to do that mm -hmm. um and then again um you know read reputable material plan for an exit and get trauma care that's good that's awesome well for those there are some great resources on your website so for those people that want to get in touch with you give us the links and how to get in touch with you and i'll make sure i put all that in the show notes okay um if you're a survivor, um, our website is saferelationshipsmagazine.com. And uh, we also have a uh, Facebook page called the Institute for Relational Harm Reduction. If you are a survivor therapist, um, we do training for therapists in this. And our website is survivortreatment.com. Our, our training workshops for therapists are on um, the survivortreatment.com website. Perfect. We offer a certification program in narcissistic and psychopathic abuse at That's Survivor awesome. Treatment. That's awesome. Well, I'll make sure, like I said, to put all these links in the show notes. This has been incredibly in educational. Um, and I, I just think as a, as a Christian, so many times we just try to go, Oh, well, you need to be forgiving or you just need to extend grace. Or even like you said, you know, writing a timeline. Well, you're just keeping a score. Well, no, these behaviors keep hurting me and I'm writing these down so I don't feel crazy and so that I can do something about it if, if this continues. And I, I like how you shared all those things. 
Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed being here and ho hope people gathered some new insights between the difference between episodic and pathological disorders, which will help them. I thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This has been incredibly helpful. We'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah. This episode has been brought to you by Life Beyond Betrayal. Life Beyond Betrayal is a comprehensive program that provides a community as well as three courses for women. The first course is Surviving Trauma Beyond Betrayal. Our second course is called Grieving Beyond Betrayal. And the third course is called Reclaiming You Beyond Betrayal. This is a self-paced program that you can take as long as you want to go through and also provides a community so that you feel like you have the support that you need. So check out Life Beyond Betrayal membership at lifebeyondbetrayal.com.